Hey Skiers, I'm Jeff from SkiEssentials.com. I'm Bob, how's it going? Bob, welcome back to Top 5 Fridays. Thanks. Yeah. Happy anniversary. Oh yeah, we went on a nice like 25 mile bike ride through the woods here in Vermont. It was just a... Sounds lovely. It was actually like cold. It was like 40 degrees. Uh, yeah, it was. It was yeah. a weird day. Now we're back to 80 degrees. Back to 80. Um, I don't know if you saw in the comments, but you had a lot of, of well wishes yeah. from our, our audience. It's been 10 glorious years. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, with that said, I think we'll just get right into the news. Um, kind of a unique week for news this week. We have a lot of uh, a lot of topics that kind of surround technology in the ski industry. Um, but before we get to those, Altera has hired a new president. Um, this week, Altera announced that Jared Smith will be the new president of the Altera, Altera Mountain Company. Um, pretty interesting. You know, it kind of Matt McGinnis, who writes Top 5 Fridays, he kind of posed the question, like, if you were in charge of hiring somebody for a major ski company, you know, like Altera and Vail, basically, yeah. or like the two big ones now, would you look inside the ski industry or would you look outside the ski industry? And this guy was Ticketmaster background, right? Exactly. Yeah. So Altera went outside the ski industry. Um comes from a pretty interesting background. Most recently was the president and global chairman of Ticketmaster. Um, so pretty interesting. And yeah, they clearly went outside of the ski industry. Yeah. Which I think is interesting and probably the right decision for a company as big as Altera. Yeah. I mean, I think at that point you kind of have to, as much as it pains me to say, put your skiing passion aside and say, we're, we're running a global business here. Like, yeah. You know, you really have to have that type of view, I guess, um, you know, but hopefully it doesn't lose, you know, the soul and the spirit of the sport, which is what attracts pretty much everyone to it in the first place. At least a big portion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Pretty interesting. Um, some kind of stats on Jared. He's been on multiple billboards, power 100 lists. Okay. Not something that I've ever been on. This is still time. That's how I get that $49 million <laughs> house in Aspen. Bob and I were just shopping for houses in Aspen in the 40 to $49 million range before we started filming. Uh, <laughs> and this, this did, uh, there are some kind of, some interesting similarities between his background and what his job at Altera is going to be. Um, you know, if you kind of take a step back and look at both of them in the grand scheme of things, it's attracting crowds to venues through entertainment right the entertainment's different and the venues are different but it's kind of the same same theme right um, and the other thing that i thought was interesting another point um, is that resorts are diversifying their attractions more than ever before yeah you know we're seeing more emphasis on summer attractions and also like you know, Stowe, we have that fancy performing arts center up there. You got the ice rating, the right. ice skating rink. There's there's lots of stuff going on. Yeah, even within winter, there's yeah, exactly. more attractions. Yeah, yeah. so kind of makes sense that they're bringing in somebody with more of a broader background in attracting different people. Yeah. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll see if they make any, if, if Jared just steps in and makes any main, major changes. It'll be interesting to see. Yep. Um, second topic of the week, and this is kind of where we're moving into some technology focused stuff. Uh, we had a cool article from the Colorado Sun that kind of took a close look at how COVID kind of accelerated development and enforced modernization in the ski industry, um, which is something that we've talked about before. Um, and it is, you know, I think it's fair to say that this was kind of the Skiing was on this path already. This was going to be the natural progression of, of kind of how ski areas operate. Um, they had a quote from Altera's head of marketing, Eric Forsell, who said, COVID accelerated everything. We took a multi-year process and did it in like five months. Yeah. So like, you know, and specifically like the reservation system that Vail employed. Yeah. Um, you know, just being able to track, like buying tickets online you know, all of these things are really, have gone from analog to digital really fast. Really fast, yeah. yeah. 
And so it'll be interesting to see what they do with whatever information they gleaned or whatever lessons they learned. Totally. And how it can, you know, contribute to the user end, the, you know, the user experience on the back end. Yeah. I mean, yeah, after, after like a pretty successful ski season for Vail, they've yep. got to be sitting on like a, a figurative mountain of data. Right. From just all those reservations. Right. And like I was saying, you used to be able to walk up to the ticket window and pay cash for a ticket and no one would ever know that you were there and what right. your deal was. Right. But now, like, if, if you buy an online ticket, you, you basically have to put your whole life story, totally. you know, in the fields on the computer and that data goes somewhere. Yep. So we'll see what they do with it. And, you know, hopefully it, it turns out for the best. Yeah. Pretty interesting. They also took a closer look at Sunlight Mountain Resort in Colorado. Um, you know, pretty similar. They had their busiest season in history and they sold 80% of their tickets online compared to 30% in past years. Yeah. So, you know, huge, huge increase. Right. And I think that even, even with mountains, looks like most mountains will be dropping their reservation systems going into the next season. But I would imagine that people will continue buying lift tickets online. Yep. At least I wouldn't be surprised. Um, a couple other things, you know, we saw like reduction of wait times, more people could order food on their phones and stuff like yep. that. You know, we've, we've, we have talked about these things on top Five Fridays before. I think all of those things has just, and you know, it, it's improved the user, ex the guest experience yeah. just overall, you know, you feel like more connected to the mountain. And, digitally. I mean, <laughs> di digitally connected. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. If you didn't have your phone in your pocket, you wouldn't feel as connected. But... No, you just have to go skiing. <laughs> <laughs> what, what a concept. <laughs> um, so, yeah, pretty interesting. Head on over to the Colorado Sun if you want to read more about that kind of stuff. Um, and then a similar topic for number three, uh, drones are growing in use as a tool to help ski patrol. Um, this is actually a video from Drone DJ, the company, so it's kind of less of a, a news piece and more of like an advertising video, yep. but that's okay. It's still pretty cool. Um, they've focused on Val uh, and showed their ski patrollers using drones in a number of different ways. Um, rescue missions, kind of quickly finding potential injured skiers or buried skiers and also assessing the situation, you know, yep. like instead of being on the ground, you're up in the air and you can kind of get a bigger picture of the whole whole environment. Um, similarly, they're using them to inspect avalanche mitigation equipment, you know, instead of somebody having to climb up somewhere and, and check yep. whatever piece of equipment, they can check a lot of that stuff with drones. And then th what I thought was the, the coolest application, not that it's that much different than the first two, is regular on-trail safety inspections. And I don't know why it's amusing to me, but I'm just imagining like a bunch of drones checking all the trails in the morning instead of like right 15 ski patrollers or them following you down because you're going too fast yeah yeah so before we started <laughs> filming I, I said something like it's my it's my goal to have a drone tell me to slow down yeah i mean they'll be equipped with the rfid guns and they'll just be able to turn your turn your pass off in the sky right that's true the drones they're coming for us or they'll just like <laughs> chase me to the bottom and <sighs> Anyways, I do think it's pretty cool. Um, and yeah. Matt, Matt brought up an interesting point in the in the written article that, you know, we've been talking about ski patrollers and kind of just their position in society, mm -hmm. um, you know, largely like how much they get paid and that kind of stuff. This feels like it'll start getting implemented more. In theory, it'll reduce the amount of ski patrollers needed, potentially. Um, but would it would make it a, a higher skilled position. I mean, you're yeah. bringing in like, you got to be a drone operator in, in addition to like practically a doctor. Right. So you would think that that would increase the pay, which, you know, you never know. Maybe that would be, maybe that would be a benef beneficial thing for the world of ski patrollers if you had a, a little bit less, but yeah. higher paid. Yeah, anytime you can take the human out of a dangerous situation, you know, and replace it with a drone. Totally. Yeah. So much the better. Yep. Less less chance of, of further accidents. Yes. Which is always great. Um, and then last topic of the week uh, is a 
Story from Washington Post that highlights a world-leading effort from Aspen Skiing Company, and we're specifically talking about the Elk Creek Mine. Um, so back in 2012, the Elk Creek Coal Mine was shut down, uh, but continued to leak methane gas. Uh, the late Randy Udall shared an idea to capture the methane and convert it to electricity. Um, there was kind of some back and forth between like the owners of the mine and environmentalists and, and Aspen Skiing Company, but ultimately that led to the creation of a methane power plant. Uh, fast forward to where we are right now, um, and they've almost paid off the investment. So the plant generates about a hundred to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in revenue each month. And as of now, they've paid off four point five nine million of the initial. 5.34 million investment. So getting pretty darn close. Um, environmental benefits are really cool. It captures 250 billion cubic feet of methane each year, which is about the equivalent to the average use of 500,000 cars per year. I mean, that seems like a lot of methane to me. It does. Yeah. Yeah. That, that statistic was surprising yeah. to me. And I guess I don't know that much about coal mines. I also don't know much about how much methane cars emit. It seems like the... Well, I wonder if it's a different... If they're comparing that methane to whatever, like, CO2 emissions right. we're getting from cars. I am not sure. Again, not a scientist. But whenever a reputable news source tells me something like that, I just take right. it as truth, um, for better or for worse. So... Pretty cool. You know, I think it's really cool to see like unique projects like this yep. working. Um, unfortunately, it also seems like we're not going to get many more of them. Right. Uh, the cost benefit the return isn't, to it, isn't in its favor and there's more efficient ways of producing electricity. Yeah. So basically in the last 10 years, we've gotten better at efficiently producing electricity. Right. Um, and the return on investment, you know, lengthwise has been 10 years for the investors. So they're yeah. still not profitable from their initial investment. So it's not like a super attractive investment for, you know, somebody on the outside, right. that, like the owner of that $49 million house that we're shopping right. for. Not super attractive for somebody like that. So unfortunately, it's really cool, but we probably won't see many more of them. Um, but the one in Elk Creek is is spinning a lot i don't know spinning I, yeah, I don't it know. must something must spin compressing who knows I, burning i visualize yeah like a compressor and a burner yeah but that's just I, not an engineer again not, <laughs> not engineers not scientists but that's it for topics this week uh lastly we have our edits of the week um first up is a quick two minute edit from colby stevenson called my design uh, he basically went out to mammoth mountain and specifically did a bunch of tricks that he wanted to do in his style instead of, you know, triple corks and yep. stuff like that to train for the Olympics. He was kind of a, a homage to the early years of part skiing and when things were a little bit more focused on individual style and, and how, to, how you make things look different. Right. Um, and then we have another short little edit from Hunter Hess called It's Not Much. It's really not that much. It's only about, <laughs> it's only about a minute long. Uh, but Hunter has a really fun skier to watch, and, and this is a pretty pretty unique edit, in my opinion. Um, and then we have the Quiche Company Spring Meeting. Um, this was kind of being discussed on a website called NewSchoolers.com as one of the one of the best park skiing edits that people had seen in a while. Um, it has a lot of kind of late 90s, early 2000s vibes. Instead of a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, yeah. they're using a 4 by 3 aspect ratio. It's kind of like the old TV screen shape. Um, and the music kind of feels, I don't actually know what year the music's from, but it feels like late 90s, early 2000s, kind of like punk yeah. style music. So I had a lot of fun watching that one. And then lastly... Um, this is a video. It's not really an edit. It's a long video, about an hour and a half long, I think. This is also a podcast that you should check out. Um, Taylor Lundquist was featured on the Bombhole podcast. Um, are you familiar with either of those things? Uh, I see Bombhole come across every now and then, but haven't really 
Got yeah, it. so the bomb hole guys are, they run a snowboard blog. Yeah. Um, but they've kind of crossed over into skiing a few times. Uh, they had Tanner Hall as a, a repeat guest, actually. They had him had him for, for two two podcasts, and they just had Taylor Lundquist in the most recent podcast. Taylor Lundquist, um, she has made a name for herself over the past couple of years, uh, mostly through like urban filming, um, but very, very good rail skier. Uh, and she was, she was the first female competitor in X Games real ski yeah. this past year. So pretty cool. They talk a lot about, I kind of skimmed it. I haven't listened to the whole thing, but they talk a lot about her background and you know, how she views the sport and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. So, if you got a long commute home, bring it up on your favorite podcast app, and maybe who knows? Maybe you'll become a, a fan of Bombhole. Um, I do really enjoy listening to those guys; they're they're pretty entertaining. Yeah. Um, and I think that's it, Bob. Anything you want to leave our audience with before the weekend? I don't believe so. Looking forward to golf and swimming. Yep. Wish Bob and I luck in our Friday night scramble league. We'll be teeing off in three hours. Nice. <laughs> All right, we'll talk to you next week. Bye.